and welcome to Property Question Time. I'm Stephen Galpin and this is a show where you can have your property related questions answered by a team of property experts and joining me today is John Reynolds, property developer, investor and founder of Titan Property Developments. Welcome to you John. We obviously didn't frighten you off the first time so no, you're back. Happy to be here. Jolly good to see you. Joining John is David Gellman, Director of Galliard Homes, one of London's now largest private developers. Welcome to you, David. Hello, how are you? Don't look so sad. Property, development, <laughs> property development's not that down in, down in the dumps at the moment. So, uh, okay, well, let's try and cheer everybody up. Um, David, your question. What fundamental changes to the UK's planning regulations and procedures would assist in the provision of new homes at relatively affordable prices? Now. What a topical question, because I mean, it's just come out today that there's a number of MPs that are trying to persuade our new Prime Minister not to have housing targets and things. I, I'm just lost with it all. I think um, it's, it's just a minefield. It's a minefield that the politicians have never really wanted to get hold of and really wanted to deal with by the looks of it. 14 housing ministers in 10 years says that, to, to be honest with you. Um, I said it previously, I've probably said it on previous shows, so I apologise. Why not get professionals to actually look after the, the housing industry? Why not take sound bites from, from people that have been building for 20, 30, 40, 50 years um, and, and see what's, what, what they can actually do? Planning, obviously the, the final granting of the permission needs to be localised and it needs to be by the local authority and it needs to be democratic. But I would say, and you're going to lambast me for it, that they ought to plan a lot, uh, privatise the actual planning system. They privatised the entire system and got people that were incentivised to try and get to a point where a local authority could give or not give planning permission and make it sensible, then it would work. Never going to happen, but that's what they should do. Well, it, it's always been a bit of a puzzle to me how, how within a planning department in a local authority, you have um, very highly qualified planning officers who are very competent in a lot of cases, very, very competent, and yet whatever their recommendation, it then goes to a, 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 a team of sort of 12 amateurs who let their own personal preferences and wants and desires to influence their decision. I just don't think it's right. You, you just said it, it's the personal opinions. We work to very clear guidelines. Yeah. And so when we're appraising or assessing a site, we can use that as a good framework. And then you go to a, a council, any council in the country, and it comes down to the personal opinion. Yeah. And they will sway that. I think your mention of privatisation is brilliant. But to make the point, it's about accountability. So as a developer, an entrepreneurial running your own business, you're accountable for your actions, your timelines. So if you say it's going to be a 13-week application, then you know, and then you go twice, three times over that. And then ultimately there's very little contact and you go for weeks without any kind of feedback and so on. That's just so frustrating. You know, it stretches and delays and causes, you know, massive. Well, you're, you're going to tell me if I'm perhaps a bit old fashioned or not, but I mean, I, certainly whenever I was involved in that sort of thing, you'd go, you'd have to go to your parish council to start with, to get a sort of in principle um, tentative approval before it went to the main planning authority. And all these steps, they cost money, they take time. You know, and then so and so's off, not at the committee meeting, so you've got to have it again two months later. Or is it not like everything where there's just too many layers of bureaucracy? Yeah. There's just too many layers of bureaucracy, um, which at the end of the day stops anything from actually happening. We get accused as de of developers of, of land banking. Now, I'm sure there are some house builders in the regions, in areas where there's an awful lot of land that, that perhaps are land banking to an extent. Guys like us, we can't land bank. The no. minute we've got our model always was. Buy the site, get planning, give it to me, get them pre-sold so that we could get it funded, build it and go on to the next one. Unfortunately, that just doesn't exist anymore because well, you can't you, get planning. But, you know, I, I don't actually get this this irritation with land banking because, you know, you're a developer. What, what's your main stock? Your main stock is land. True. That, that's what you're going to develop. So if you see, you see an opportunity to buy it, you buy it. You may not have the free funds available to develop it for this year, next year, or the year after. Well, so what? You know, it's going to come around sometime, isn't it? Well, we can't rely on the local authorities or the government to develop. So it is down to the private developer. Um, and we need help. We need help with this planning situation, but I can't see it coming. No. One, Sorry. one idea, which I'm sure you'll both smile at, is... Again, on that accountability side of things, and almost 
you know, bringing the privatization is it, a developer will pay more for certainty. Yeah. So if you had professionals in the, in the process that ultimately adhered to policies and to timelines, and you paid for that process, then ultimately- What, in higher if, fees? Yes. Yeah, yes. Okay. Yeah. If they failed to meet those timelines, there'd be a penalty. Yeah. Dare I say a refund? Now, I'm sure, yeah, I knew you'd laugh. But, but imagine us in a private sense of business. We could agree course, that, because yeah. you know what, I can do that, and yeah. I will make that happen. And we agree what we need to have. We're both aligned. It needs new housing, we want to do new housing, but the whole thing falls apart and no one's accountable. And just, we, we're There's just no incentive. The There's no incentive. There's no incentive to incentive. give planning. But I've said this so many times on these shows, you know, when, when you get the, the government coming out and say, we're going to build 300,000 homes, who, who's we? You know, who do, who do they mean? Um, because it's down to guys like you, whether it's economically viable to build those homes. If you can sell them, you're going to build them as fast as you can go, right? But if you're not sure, that's, that's when things start to clog up and when, when planning authorities don't have clear guidelines. I mean, I, I, I agree with you, uh, David, it, it, it should be democratic, it should be localised. You know, people, people know best their own location, don't they? And they know what's right and what's wrong, really. Um, but there needs to be, you know, government guidelines to say, you, no, you can't just refuse this because you don't like it or, you know. It's just classic NIMBYism, simple Well, it that. is. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, all right, well, thank you for that. Um, John, with such an emphasis on energy conservation at this time, do the panel think that the government's push to encourage retrospective insulation is really practical. It seems to be difficult to finance such works. The payback period is often very long. And although loft insulation is the obvious target, without the rest of the property being treated, effects may be absolutely minimal in, in relation to the cost. Or even counterproductive. counterproductive you know, if, you, if you're yeah. insulating the loft, you're, you're isolating the sort of header tanks and other you know, pipes in there that then ultimately can freeze and break and cause further problems. I think it's a, it's a, it's a construction, it's a build um, issue where you know, you're talking uh, glazing, energy efficient boilers, you know, and, and how far do you go with it? Almost like bringing a kind of an almost a EPC rating into that scenario. I think it's great the government are trying to help. So credit where it's due, but it's like a sticky plaster over a broken leg. It's not gonna fix the problem. And it's being kind of more pioneered in the traditional English terraced house, but it's not really working. No. You know, it needs more thought. And we've said it in this conversation enough times, it's decisions being made that haven't really felt like they've been well thought well, through. It was, I read an article the other day, it was about these um, heat pumps that you could, you, you could now have. And, and somebody was looking up what they should do to help with their uh, energy economies. And, and they went on the government side and said, the only way you can do this is you get a heat exchange, a heat pump, okay? So I thought, all oh, right, well, that's good. And they start looking it up and it's 35 grand for the heat pump. But then it doesn't stop there. You've got to have the floors in the building at the right levels and the right composition. Um, you've then got to do other things with the, the, the piping and the radiators because they're not suitable for normal radiators, are they? And so the, this advice, which was the only advice available on the government's website, sort of looked at you spending the thick end of 100 grand. Yeah. I mean, it's just not going to happen. I mean, you know, well, if it was me, I'd be long gone before I was getting any money back, you know? Yeah. yeah. No, this is the problem. It's, it's got to be paid somehow. They're all great ideas. Yeah. Um, and again, sitting here as, as developers, that becomes the conversation of trying to put that into new homes, because of course that then eliminates yeah. any retrospective stuff. But that, again, it costs Huge money. Costs. And uh, you know, are you going to get that back on the value of your home? Doesn't seem to be at the moment. No. That's well, the we, we, we can think of a couple of surveying firms that wouldn't give you an uplift for evaluation. <laughs> <laughs> this is the problem. If you, if, if you could genuinely say, I'll spend an extra 50K and I'll get it, then of course that works. That's not how the system works. Well, it's a pity we haven't got a bit more sunshine in this country because I quite like Elon Musk's idea of having these uh, battery banks outside of uh, outside of your house and storing up your own energy. But I, I think we'd struggle a bit here in November, wouldn't we? Absolutely. <laughs> we'd, we'd all be, a, we'd all be a bit cold. Are you, are, are you rowing back on sort of green items in your developments, David? 
We're not rowing back on them because we don't have any choice but to uh, but produce them and to uh, include them within the schemes because that's part of the part of the whole planning process. Do they, do the they environment. Specify? Do they specify what you must do, or do they just give you a, a target no, they, energy they, rating? It depends where it is, and depends which local authority they specify what what you've got to what you've got to achieve. Mm, very difficult, isn't it? Again, and it comes down to this business of consistency, I suppose. There isn't any different no. in every authority. Do it's just like refereeing a Premier League, League game. It's the same thing. There's no, you know, there's lack of consistency because it is down to people's personal uh, opinion and conjecture at the end of the day. That's part of it. We've got a scheme that we've. Um, We've owned the site now about two and a half, three years in Reading. And they have just brought in or suggested now implemented a zero carbon policy. Great idea. Um, but it's mid application. We've already done our viability on and appraisal and it's been enforced. So again, that's coming all our way and we will have to adhere to that to build the, these, these flats out, incorporating it. Um, and it comes off our bottom line. But also, doesn't aesthetics come into this? I mean, I th I'm th just thinking if I bought a lovely barn conversion or something, the last thing I'd want is a solar panel in the roof and a, and a windmill whizzing around in the garden. I mean, I just, <laughs> just, 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 just wouldn't amuse I think me. the windmill it. sounds quite nice. I agree <laughs> the solar panels are no good. <laughs> OK. All right. Well, that's all we've got time for in this half of the show. So join me again after the break when we'll be asking John and David more of your questions. <laughs> Hello and welcome back to part two of Property Question Time with David Gelman and John Reynolds. Welcome back. Uh, David, do the panel think that the current energy crisis will have an impact on construction practices related to energy efficiency? If so, what kind of changes are we likely to see in new build residential properties? I suppose I mean, there's an extension of what I was just asking you really, isn't it? Pretty much. Um, I think We've been through the we've we've been through the whole process of providing centralised heating and uh, and hot water systems. We've been through the process. I think you live in a building where where you've got the centralised system that actually twelve months later was turned off because it wasn't working properly. I'm sure we've had that conversation. Correct. Yeah. Um, so you've got all of those things to uh, think about. I think it will. I think that that um, the idea of a centralised system should work, but unfortunately. So the caps that the individual per the individual homeowner is able to take advantage of we at the moment, get. you can't get them. Businesses can't get them, and so on and so forth. And it's going to push service charges up because if it's include if your energy is included in your service charge, it's going to put push service charges well, up. Well, our so heating and cooling uh, costs have gone up three to four hundred percent. Yeah, I was just saying to you, we've got a scheme where the service charge should, was originally five five pound fifty per square foot. It's a PD. Um, and because of the energy cost this year, it's just gone to eleven pounds. It's just not sustainable. Right. And that's before you used to have things filtering through from other service providers that have that have been hit with increased costs for their provision of their services. Correct. Yeah. So I mean, because that usually runs a year behind, doesn't it? It's, it's. I think it's going to be a really tough year for a lot of people. I really do. Yeah. Hundred percent. When you when you're doing, um, shall we say, a number of individual houses as opposed to apartment blocks and that sort of thing H how much effort do you put into i know you have to meet your energy rating levels mm. don't you but yeah. how much extra energy do you put into green items okay so well we have put extra energy in in developments that um, are now completed the, the the tricky part which we've also kind of covered in this conversation is that anything extra and further that we do in a market that has slumped and again we've made decisions on this development in fact we're doing uh, nine uh, barn conversions if you like out in Wimborne and Dorset right now and we'd love to do more but the viability just doesn't support us being able to do probably as much as we'd like so it, it does come down to the affordability of what we can ultimately do. Just in simple terms, do you, uh, I mean, barn conversion must be a sort of classic example. Do you get people come along and sort of say, well, wow, really love this, love this idea of, you know, spacious living, which of, often they are not, not always that practical, are they, in terms of design, because you're a little bit limited sometimes. But nevertheless, beautiful sort of expansive spaces. Um, do they come along saying, yeah, but you know what, it's going to cost me a lot to heat this, it's going to cost me a lot to run it. Are you getting more of that conversation now? 
um, from our point of view, I'm too early in the construction period to have those conversations. Right. So maybe in a few months time, I'll let you know. I think that I've been speaking to the local agents and paying attention to other developments around this one. Uh, and that is definitely coming into the conversation. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And I'm betting for the first time, your, your overseas buyers are starting to say, well, what are the running costs? Like, yeah, no, they are. They're, 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 they're looking at, because a lot of the overseas buyers, are, 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 as well as buying for investment, they do buy for their family. The misnomer of em empty properties for overseas buyers doesn't exist. It's a, another headline from a, from a newspaper. But um, they are asking that question, what's it going to cost? They, they, they scrutinise the service charge. They scrutinise all of the costs before they're, they're making their offers. We, I think we're a little bit lucky still that there is a, that London is still the focus for international purchases. They don't want to be in Paris. They don't want to be in Frankfurt. They want to be in London. So. Well, our real estate laws are, are superb, aren't they, in terms of safety of ownership, in terms of knowing where you are. And it is a capital city. There's always going to be somebody, isn't there? Maybe not at the level you want, but there's always somebody. He'll be back. <laughs> They'll be back, yeah. OK, thank you for that, David. John, uh, what do the panel think that... Um, Will be the effect of rent caps if they're introduced. What would, what would effect would it have on the buy to let market? Interesting. I mean, it sounds like it's almost inevitable with Scotland, Wales, and I think Ireland as well now have embraced it. So, I mean, you know, we've just completed as recent as Monday on a project that uh, we're going to ultimately build to rent. So it's four in, four properties we're converting into thirty one apartments. So all the calculations have been done. On the appraisal side of things, on the current rents, so slightly different way of answering the question. But from my point of view, I'm doing all my calculations now as a professional investor. Um, and if suddenly there's a rent cap brought in, it's about how it's phased in. It can't just be brought in, you know, quickly, and then it's going to come off my bottom line and cause me problems. And I think that's the direct relevance to buy to let investors who do it as a business. Um, the whole idea is you've got your expenditure. And then your your income is the rent. So, with costs going up and all these uh, these other factors, it's how that's going to be generating an income for people that are ultimately doing it as a business and rely on that. Yeah. Well, I mean, buy, buy to let is just a, a sort of margin business, isn't it? You know, you 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 borrow and buy at this level, and you rent out and you let at that level. Bit in the middle. Yeah. So yeah. You, you take the bit out of the middle, and with all these fluctuating costs rising interest rates and all that. So we were having this discussion the other day, for instance, you know, if you're, if you're borrowing at 2% over base and base is half a percent, well, okay, that's so much. But if you're borrowing at 2% over base and the base is seven, you know, yeah, that's, that's a big cash difference. Absolutely. Although, make it unviable. although in theory, the margin is the same, but you know, um, True. It, it's a very difficult market. And I, I can see a lot of people coming out of the buy-to-let market, especially with the sort of government trying to discourage the accidental um, landlord and um, trying to push things towards bigger corporate exercises. I mean, I think bigger corporate exercises can work in some ways. You will get consistency of, of product. Um, you, you know, if people are, you know, if the big insurance companies, for instance, or some of the big department stores even are doing it now, and they're having blocks built and saying, we're going to rent them. Um, you, you'll get good quality product on the market. True. I think you might see, you might see, and you could see, uh, you're saying about big department stores and, and, and co converting their properties into, into build to rent units. You could see a little bit of brand loyalty coming in. I think you're going to see a lot of people that are going to be renters for the rest of their lives. Um, so they'll rent a Stephen Galpin home. Yeah. Um, and then when they're ready to move to a slightly bigger Stephen Galpin home, because they've been such good tenants and you've been a good landlord, uh, you'll say, come and have a look at my scheme around the corner and it's slightly more expensive. And I think that that's going to happen. But David, with, with your company, that's what that's how you exist, isn't it? Very much. You've got a very good following of, of buyers from around the world who, who, who follow your developments. And that's great. I mean, we're not going to mention the department store, but it's, it, it's a big department store that's well known for, shall we say, good, solid quality. Um, I, I think they'll get quite a following if they if, if they carry on with their the buy to let. You say brand loyalty, um, but it's it's a very difficult market, and I, I I just shudder to think how the government will think about bringing in a cap. 
I mean, if you're a landlord and you have to register your rent with the local authority, that's fine because you can just say, well, okay, we'll permit a 5% uplift this year or next year or, or whatever. That's easy to do. But when you're starting off from a, you know, pick a number out of the sky, I just don't know how it's going to work. No, I totally agree. I think one thing we've noticed is there's a lot of people that love the asset class, buy to let. And whether they're in it already or they've been wanting to get into it, people are sat on cash now and they're terrified of the inflation and potential future and stocks and shares are volatile. So I think some of the traditional buy-to-let uh, landlords that are selling now in a sort of panic are being replaced by people that are taking a much longer term view. That bricks and mortar, not necessarily looking to take the income now, but very much just want to plug in, be part of it. And it's kind of uh, a pension and a inheritance for the, the kids. I, I was always brought up to believe that property is not a five minute business. And if you think it is, you're a mug. <laughs> you're, you're correct. <laughs> yeah. Um, but there we are. Look, gents, what I'd like to do, just for the last couple of minutes of the show, I, I, I just wonder if I could first to you, David, and then to you, John, ask you just for your thoughts on the market for the coming year. Thank you for that very nice, easy question. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to be tough because there's, uh, there's a, almost a perfect storm. You've got interest rates rising. You've got you know, interest rates were so low for so long that suddenly it's a little bit of a shock to the system for um, individuals that all of a sudden, as you've just said, they were paying two, three percent above a very, very low base. You know, a mortgage rate now could be up to sort of six, six and a half percent. Now, compared to when it went to 15%, which you and I remember, that's not too bad, but actually it's still, it depends where it's coming from to reach there. So I think it's going to be very tough. I don't see a crash. I do see some distress in the market whereby there are some developers, some individuals that may have bought things at the top of the market and with interest rates on the floor, suddenly they'll be looking at, or the bank will be looking at how do we get out of this? How do we help them get out of out of out of that problem? So I think there'll be a little bit of that, um, but I genuinely don't see a crash because there's still this huge structural shortage of property. Yeah, and it's going to go on. We all need homes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I echo that. I think um, I've talked about it with a lot of people, including people in banking that I know and financiers. And I think the reason why I think there won't be a crash is there's a lot of people that are effectively sitting on on cash. And it's, it's clear that everything's just nosediving. So we're sort of trying not to be doom and gloom right now, but it is a pretty negative environment. At, certain, at a certain point, people that are sitting, whether they're professional developers, investors, or just people with money in the bank that want to come in, will make a decision that that was X, it's now Y, feels like a good investment, and I'll come in, rather than a crash is where there's no one there wanting to buy anything. Um, and I think exactly the fact that there's not enough stock you know, creates a scenario where there's, you know, people that want to, to come in. Well, I mean, David referred to the days of 15% interest rates. I can remember sitting in the developer's office with it going up half a percent every two or three minutes. And I, mean, I, 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 I won't describe some of the language that was going on in there and some of the sweat, sweaty brows. And also at that time, I think we went into a, 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 an almost total void of any property transactions. And I, I, I could, it was almost two years, I think, before anything actually So I can remember seeing the first sold sign on an agent's board for ages. And I'm quite, you know, almost crashed the car, you know, looking at it. I mean, it's, I, I don't think we're going back to that because I say, I think, I think homes are, are, are needed. But um, I think I'll just finish by, by saying, you know, when people say to me, oh, well, I'm sitting on property, it's all going down in value and I'm going to lose money. I'll just say, well, don't sell it. Exactly. It's when you crystallise, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Well, look, um, David Gelman from Galliard Homes, thank you very much for coming Pleasure. in. John Reynolds from Titan Property Developments, thank you for coming in. Thanks, great answers, great subjects. Thank you so much. I'm Stephen Galpin. Join me next time on Property Question Time. Thank you.